I want to welcome you to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. So good to have you with us as always. We're in a study of, well, what I would say is the most important subject in the Bible. And I know that's a strong statement. But the Bible preeminently is a book of love. And that's what we're considering in this series. Love not just from the ideas, the opinions, the beautiful poetry of man, but from the truth of God's Word. 1 Corinthians 13, I think, gives us the best picture we can have of what true agape, Christ-like love is all about. Thus far, we've talked about how knowing this love means patience plus kindness. It means that you're enduring the abuse of somebody else. You're willing to forgive them 70 times 7. You're willing to turn the extra cheek, but you're also willing to go the extra mile to show kindness to the one that mistreats you. Love, we've seen, will lead to humility. Somebody with love doesn't care whether they get recognition or praise or thank yous. They're giving of themselves without desiring anything in return, any self-glory, and they're unselfish. It doesn't matter how much it costs me. I'm going to care for that other person. That's the love that we're talking about here. It suffereth long and is, in, and, and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not, itself is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. You know, we, we look at all of these things, and you might be thinking, you know, why would anyone ever desire this attribute? It sounds awful. Here you are having to show kindness to an enemy. Here you are being uh, humbled and no one's praising you and you're giving and you're not receiving anything in return. But we're going to see in this lesson, love is the only thing that's going to bring you true joy in this world. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 6 is the text that we're going to look at. It says that charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. When you show the love of Christ, yes, it may cost you very much. Yes, it might be towards somebody who just mistreats you even as you love them. It might not be something that's praised by the world around you, but you will never regret it. There's a greater joy that love brings than you're going to find anywhere else. Love doesn't mean you're going to receive a worldly reward. No, love is the reward in and of itself. So we're going to look at this, and we're going to see this joy really from two perspectives here in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. First of all, that it, it hinders or keeps us from things that would hinder our joy. But then secondly, it directs us and it motivates us in the way of true joy. So whatever your situation in life is right now. Young or old, rich or poor, this is the way that you find fulfillment. This is the way you find peace and the pleasure that you're created to have. We need that Christ-like love. Let's break this down. Let's look at it first from the negative perspective. Love will never rejoice in iniquity. Do you ever do that? Rejoice in iniquity? You know, I doubt any of us come home from work and, and say, you know what, I, I goofed around, uh, I, I cheated some time out of my employers, uh, I laughed at some dirty jokes, I, I spread some gossip about a few people. That was a good day. We generally aren't proud and embrace our sin. And at least for a Christian, that ought to be something that's very rare for us. And yet, we do rejoice in iniquity in more subtle ways. You know, it's often we are so caught up in and excited about something that is wrong, ungodly in our life, that we refuse to think about what it really is, to accept it for what it is. Whether that might be uh, entertainment, we just love the show, so we don't, we want to, we'll make an allowance for some things that aren't, aren't good in it, or a relationship, or a part of our life where we're just so consumed with the world that we have no time for the Lord. 
but we're focusing on, on those desires and giving ourselves over to them. So we push off our guilty thoughts and, and we embrace iniquity. That's one way we do it. A second way we might rejoice in iniquity is that we, we see it in the lives of others. And we look at them and perhaps with a feigned disgust, but deep down it's our pride rising up in us. And we say, God, I thank thee that I'm not as this other person. We put on a show of, of hatred for their wickedness, but deep down we're glad about it. Why? Because it makes us look that much better. We don't want to help them overcome it. We want them to actually sink deeper down in that mire so that we get the glory. We get the preeminence. You know, that's a terrible spirit, but I think we probably all fall more into that trap than we care to, care to admit. Love is the answer to this. Let's consider how this stirs us up against iniquity. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Well, first of all, it reveals sin. You know, with all the ideas and the opinions of the world around us, it's, it's kind of hard to identify what iniquity really is. It's kind of hard to pin down, well, what is sin? Is it what society thinks is unacceptable? Is it what is going to displease your superiors, your boss at work, or your parents? Is it what the church frowns on or the pastor rails on from the pulpit? Well, I think the Word of God gives us a very clear way to identify sin for what it is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. That's not the law of the United States. That is God's law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was, that Christ, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Sin is everything that is opposed to God's commands here in his word. And of course, we have a very clear foundation for what is right that identifies sin. It's a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. It shows us the false ways. But we could go beyond that. Sin is everything that's opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what really identifies sin. I'll give you an illustration. You know, when I was young, my mother worked really hard with us to try to teach us our manners. And she, it was a challenge for her with with uh, young children, and particularly my brother and I, the young boys, to try to teach us, keep your elbows off the table, don't chew with your mouth open. And, you know, I, I don't know if I ever got it down as much as I should. And then I moved out on my own. And those manners kind of went out the window a little bit. I mean, I was on my own. I was by myself. I didn't really worry about what anybody thought. Then I met my wife. And we got married. Suddenly those manners began to matter. I began to think about it when I had my elbows on the table or I'm chewing with my mouth open or if I'm doing something that annoys her or, or bothers her or embarrasses her. It, it wasn't just because it was the rule, it was because I cared about her that suddenly those manners began to matter. And you know, this is kind of how we truly see sin in our hearts for what it is. Yes, we can, we can learn the rules and we can memorize all of this book. But if you're going to grasp the fullness, the full evil of sin, you're going to see it for what it is, well, you've got, it, that's only going to happen when you come to know and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, when I'm walking close to Him, when I'm devoted to Him, I naturally become convicted and I become grieved about anything that, dis, that, that dishonors Him, that displeases Him. 1 John 119 brings this out beautifully. It says in verse 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way, because I have this revelation to me of God and this wonderful gospel and this relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, that makes me naturally hate everything that detracts from Him, dishonors Him. No one continuing for a long time 
No believer, particularly continuing for a long time in a transgression, has an excuse of ignorance. Well, I just didn't know it was wrong. Well, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to examine your life. You're going to be on your knees. Lord, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in thy way everlasting. And that's a prayer God's going to answer. You're going to be in the word drawing near to him. Iniquity is going to be revealed for all that it is. So first of all, through our love for Christ, sin is revealed. But then secondly, well, it's going to lead to repentance. Somebody with love is going to repent of their sin. You know, a lot of confusion abounds about that word repentance. And I, I wonder if sometimes kind of intentionally we don't really, know, really lay hold of the meaning of that word. People think of it uh, just as guilty feelings about someone or, or confessing the sin to a, a priest, saying a prayer about it, maybe doing some penance for it. This biblical word for repentance, though, is not just about words that we say or a religious process we go through. 1 Thessalonians brings this out well, talking about his ministry to these believers there in that city. He says in verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And he goes on to say, verse 9, uh, of their testimony that the world, the Gentiles around them, show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's repentance. It's turning from the idols of this world, turning from the things that displease the Lord, and you're turning to Him and serving Him. You know, a while back I went through... The, a study of Pilgrim's Progress with the church. And uh, we actually did videos on that also. I think you could probably look them up. But in that study, the man who is going to be named Christian very soon, he finds the book of God's truth there in his city of destruction. And he realizes the evil of his ways and the doom of his place. And that burden just wears him down. He can't have any peace, and so he meets evangelists, and he's pointed to the wicked gate, and he's told about the way of salvation and the hope of the celestial city. And so what does Christian do? He runs away from that city. He leaves it all behind. People call to him to come back. doesn't matter. I can't stay there. That's repentance. It's a wholehearted fleeing from sin. And I can tell you what's going to cause you to repent. If you're going to do it from your heart, it's going to be love. It's going to be love for the Lord. That's what's going to bring it. Not the flames of hell. Not a fear of judgment. Worry about what other people think. No, no. We're talking about real repentance. That comes from a desire for the Lord. I can't stand anything that keeps me from fellowship with Him. That is, that is bringing shame on His name. That is standing in the way of my ministry for Him. No, I, that's a burden I can't bear. And so we turn from it. He's worth infinitely more to us than anything else in this world we have to give up. That's the spirit of repentance. Thirdly, I want us to consider how love changes the way that we view sin in others. You know, today it's preached that, you know, if you've got love for somebody, that means you're going to embrace them and accept them as they are. Don't judge them. Be kind and nice to everyone. Keep your mouth shut. That's their business. Just show love and accept them. Well, if we have Christ-like agape, that giving, caring love for others, well, we can't do that. I remember years ago when my son was much younger, I, was, uh, I came outside one day and he was carrying a ladder across the yard. What are you doing with the ladder today? Well, I'm going to climb on the roof. Now, I'm sure he had a lot of fun plans for that trip up to the roof. Going to run up and down uh, on the slope. Going to stand up on the very tip of the roof, see how far he could see. Maybe walk over to the edge and look down. Lots of fun plans. And, you know, I could have just said, you know what, I want you to enjoy yourself. Go ahead. But I pictured my son rolling down off that roof and falling down, injuring himself. 
I couldn't let him do that. I cared about my son too much for that. I had to take the ladder away. I had to warn him about ever getting it out again. That's not hatred. That's love. Love is going to rebuke sin, not with the pride of a Pharisee. Not with hatred or disgust, but devotion to the one that we're reaching out to. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, he he spent so much of this epistle having to rebuke this church for for all the things, the the ways that they've gone astray in their pride, in their disorderly service, in their false doctrine, in so many ways, their neglect of others. But when he's doing this, he's not venting his frustration. No, he's reaching out to them. And look what he says in 2 Corinthians when he writes them another epistle. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears that you should not be grieved, (coughs) but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. I'm writing to you and I'm dealing with this sin and I'm rebuking you for it and calling you to repentance because I care and I see the destruction of that way and I want to see you delivered from it. That's the spirit of love. Regardless of what the world thinks, how they interpret it, this ought to be the spirit of love that we display. Yes, we're, we want to lift others up. We want to see them blessed. We want them to know we care. But that means we're not going to ignore sin. We're going to point them to a way of deliverance from it in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the spirit of love. This is the the way that love keeps us from things that hinder our joy. It reveals sin. It leads us to repentance. And it gives us the strength to stand against sin in the lives of those around us. But let's look at the positive side. Love rejoiceth in the truth. Kind of like sin, truth is sort of an abstract term to the world, and and it's hard to pin down. Well, this is what I think is truth. Well, I think this is truth. Well, you have your truth, and I have my truth. But you know, the Bible gives us an absolute definition. It reveals a sure truth, not just an opinion of it. It gives us a complete revelation of who God is and what He has done and what He desires for our life. And of course, more than that, I can say it reveals to us the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus proclaimed the truth. But He did more than that. He exemplified the truth. And He's the way of finding the truth in our own hearts and our own lives as our Lord and Savior. In Jeremiah 24, verse 7, here's this wonderful promise. I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. You're not going to find the truth just by reading words on a page, although I encourage you to read the Bible by trying to memorize the verses, by just trying to force yourself to obey them. The Pharisees did all of that, and they were as blinded to the truth as ever. Truth comes through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And truth becomes more real to us, and we're strengthened to follow the truth when we're walking close to Him in that loving relationship. It's all about love. That's the answer. So let's get into this a little deeper. How does love cause us to rejoice in the truth? Well, first of all, it moves us to study the truth. You know, when I fell in love with my wife, I wanted to know all about her. Not, you know, tell me how well you cook and clean. No, what kind of flowers do you like? I wanted to know how I could bring joy into her life because she had brought so much joy into mine. How much more true is this with our Heavenly Father and with our Lord and Savior? Psalm 119, verse 97 tells us, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And it goes on to say in verse 7, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. Somebody that really loves God, It's going to want to know God. 
in a personal way. They're going to want to be close to God. If you really love the Lord, you're going to seek Him. That means you're going to be spending some time in His Word, listening to Him. You're going to be down on your knees in prayer, not just asking Him to give you things, but communicating with Him, communing with Him. You're going to be want, to, want to be with His people. And in a part of that fellowship, that spirit of love draws us to God. We're never too busy to be seeking Him for time with Him. Nothing matters more than knowing Him and fellowshipping with Him and pleasing Him. That's the heart of love. It rejoices in the truth. If you love God, you're drawn to the truth. And you shouldn't need any other motivation to come to church or to be in the Word. I know we have a lot of distractions. We have to fight the flesh. But what's going to help you grow as a Christian? What's going to help you be faithful? Well, it's love. Secondly, love submits to the truth. You know, James says in his epistle that faith without works is dead. People talk about their faith, but if there's no works that reveal the reality of it, if it's not active, it's not real. Well, the same truth is applied to love. In fact, Galatians 5, 6 tells us faith worketh by love. There's got to be action. Jesus puts it this way in John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. When we have a love for God, well, we're going to follow him. It's got to be manifested by action. How can we say we love him when we do not the things that He commands us? That's the question. Yeah, we've got to fight those desires, but our love for God overpowers them. And the more we grow in love, the more faithful we're going to be. Here's a, a, an amazing promise. Uh, it refers particularly to the Lord Jesus Christ and His reign. But this also applies to our walk as a Christian. Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. What an awesome thing to have this spirit in my life. That close walk with God so I don't have to force myself to sacrifice for Him. I'm readily casting my crown down at His feet, crying from the depths of my heart, Thou art worthy. Where else would I rather be than serving Him? What else would I rather do than to honor His name? That gives me a peace and a hope and a joy that outweighs anything else. That's what's going to motivate your faithfulness. It's got to be love. But then thirdly, love will spread the truth. Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 34, and I kind of used this in a negative sense last sermon, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Our hearts are a fountain that cannot be stopped up. What's in your heart is going to come out in your words and it's going to come out in your actions. And it's going to leave a mark on the lives of those that are around you. And I'll admit, too often what's in my heart, it, it, it's selfish and it manifests itself in things that are hurtful to others. In a prideful spirit. In a selfish spirit to the world around me. But when we love the truth, when you're rejoicing in the truth, the truth's going to come out. You're going to be a fountain of that truth, of that blessing, of that love. You're going to long to see God glorified, and so you're going to be reaching out with the, with the testimony of, your, of His glory. You're going to be proclaiming it to the world around you. You're going to be burdened for others around you as you care for them. You're going to sorrow over their condition, and you're going to want to point them to the answer to those sins <coughs> in Jesus Christ. It's hard to be a witness. Especially for people like me. There are some that are a little more outgoing that just love to go pound on the doors and they're not going to leave until they can have a conversation with someone. There are more salesman type of people. 
I'm a little more shy when it comes to one-on-one. -on -one. It was always hard for me to go knock on doors. But you know what gets me out there, what helps me to reach out and be a witness, it's got to be love. That's got to be the spirit with all of us, regardless of your personality. If you're going to be a faithful witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be a light into this world. What's going to shine your light is His love. That joy in Him, that burden for others, that's got to be the motivation. If that's the case, you're going to be faithful. You don't need some other recognition. You don't need some other worldly reward. Oh, it's the love is the reward in and of itself. And whether somebody receives that truth or not, you can't hold it in. Love is going to spread the truth. Jesus puts it so beautifully in John chapter 7 and in verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What an invitation we have from the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not invite us to come and to find whatever worldly pleasure that we want in Him. A lot of people get this idea in their religion. You know, if I obey these rules, <coughs> I'll get more money, I'll get that promotion at work, people will love me and treat me right. And then they'll find themselves disappointed down the line and they'll give up because this is not an invitation to worldly pleasure. What we are invited to come and to receive and to be filled with and to be overflowing with is joy. A joy we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, young or old, new Christian, whether you've been saved for many years, this joy is there for the taking in your fellowship with Christ. Oh, brethren, believer, and I even speak to the unbeliever, let go of the things in this world that hold you back. Let's seek after this love. This love of Christ to us, that that might fill our hearts with wonder as we think about the price that He paid for our sins and how He's devoted and cares for us today as He stands for us before the throne of the Father. How we're beloved children of God. But then as we reflect on that amazing love, let us be filled with it. A love. It's not going to rejoice in iniquity. No, it'll reveal our sin. It'll keep us from those false ways. It'll burden and break our hearts. It'll cause us to reach out to those around us and encourage them. But then it rejoice. It'll cause us to rejoice in the truth. We'll find the fullness of that joy, that fellowship, that service to God that we're meant to have. Oh, how precious is love. Yeah, there's a cost to it, but it is the way to joy. Pray that's a blessing to you this morning. Such an encouragement for me just to be able to share the blessing that God's put on my heart with you. And I look forward as we continue on in the weeks to come in this study of 1 Corinthians 13. May the Lord bless you.